he did send it to my and again, we like to ask everyone to please mute their lines. Are you serious? Please mute your line. Thank you. All right. And the PowerPoint is worth coming and we'll get started. All right, fantastic. Again, uh, welcome to our statewide, uh, statewide revitalization programs, uh, fiscal year uh, 21 awardee orientation. And again, we're focusing on the state revitalization uh, program funded um, sources. And so that's Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative of Bernie, uh, Community Legacy, National Capital Strategic Economic Development Fund, or what we call NED, uh, SEED Community Development Anchor Institution Program. That's our uh, funding that's specifically targeted towards anchor institutions, hospitals, universities. Uh, strategic Demolition Fund for uh, Baltimore City specifically, that's Project Core, and our statewide Strategic Demolition Fund Program. Um, just as a point, and next slide, just as a point of um, review most of you guys are uh very familiar with what we do in statewide our uh, revitalization and so uh when we uh talk about statewide revitalization and it looks like we might be stuck in between slides All right, well, the Division of Neighborhood Revitalization, we're dedicated to uh, working with local partners to bring uh, investment uh, to Maryland's core communities. And we do that by offering a broad range of uh, different types of assistance programs. And so they could be loan, grant, or technical assistance. And these uh, programs are designed specifically to work with local governments, nonprofit, uh, organizations and small uh, businesses as they reinvest in communities uh, in the state of Maryland to make them great places to live, work, and prosper. Next slide, please. Now, um, as that uh, next slide is going to come up, our um, office, we divide our, the state into several regions. And so, uh, region one would be uh, Baltimore City, and that region is covered by Larry Brown. Region two, uh, and uh, that region of Baltimore City and Baltimore County, uh, that's the northwest um, area of that um, of the region. That's covered by Larry Brown, and so everything west, northwest, Larry is the person that covers that. In region two, we have a new staff person. Her name is uh, Jamila Canty. And uh, Jamila just joined us uh, this week, or last week, actually. And uh, she'll be covering Region 2, which is uh, East Baltimore, Northeast Baltimore. Uh, and that includes Baltimore County as well. Region 3 is covered by Sarah Kim, uh, and that's uh, mostly Southeast Baltimore and Southeast Baltimore County. Region 4 is covered by Nick Mayer. He covers Southwest Baltimore. Uh, portion of uh, Howard County and Anne Arundel County. Region five is covered by Sarah Jackson and that's the entire Western region. And so from Carroll County all the way over to Garrett, that's the area that she covers. Uh, region six is covered by Ashley Green. She's one of our program officers and she covers Montgomery, Prince George's, Charles, Calvert and St. Mary's counties. Region 7 is covered by Yaffa Weiss, and she covers uh, Harford, Cecil, Kent, uh, Queen Anne's, Talbot, and Caroline counties. And Region 8 is covered by myself, and those are your lower shore counties, so Dorchester, Somerset, Wicomico, and Worcester. 
and you see a list of them right there. Uh, you should have their contacts and everything. And so, but again, we're going to provide not only uh, a copy of this recording, but also a copy of the PowerPoint as well for your future reference. In addition to that, we have uh, two other staff members. They handle some, uh, they're not assigned to regions, but they handle other uh, important uh, aspects of how we work. Uh, we have Mel Melissa Archer. She's our historic preservation officer. She's the person that you would liaison with in terms of MHT reviews, and that's her contact information. And as I mentioned earlier, Olivia, she handles our sustainable communities program. And so all things sustainable communities Olivia handles for us. Now, today's agenda, uh, what we want to go through is uh, really three particular things. We want to talk about the awards life cycle. When you receive your award, what does that mean? Uh, how long does it last? And so we want to talk about the award life cycle. We want to talk about the expectations that we have of awardees in terms of the management of the award, as well as what we do on our side in project management. And then we want to go into some specific award agreement topics in terms of what things are part of the award agreement, what things are required. And we're also going to spend some time going into the system. Our uh, grants manager, uh, Brian Holtzapple, he's going to talk a little bit about the IntelliGrant system. And this is the system in which you would submit your reporting, in which you uh, make your payment request and the like. All right, and so let's talk about the award life cycle. <clears throat> this is nice, uh, beautiful color graphic right here. The award life cycle is, you know, it could be viewed as a circular type of movement. It starts with your project proposal or your submission. This happened way back in the summer. And so we release a request for uh, applications, the RFA. <clears throat> we ask people to submit those. We take those uh, submitted project proposals. We go through a review uh, process in which uh, we have review teams. And our review teams are made up of not only our staff, but we also have volunteer staff from other agencies, such as the Department of Planning, Natural Resources, um, and some others, uh, uh, MHT. And so we have a, a good wide variety of uh, commerce. And so we have a good, oh, and uh, MDOT as well. And so we have a good variety of um, people that participate us uh, with us in our review process. And so we divide up uh, the review process within those regions that are reviewed. And our, our review teams, they go through reviewing your application. You may have uh, participated in a site visit where um, we've been doing them virtual uh, since uh, COVID, but you may have uh, participated in a site visit if it was virtual or in person. And then we take that information, we come up with recommendations, and uh, we forward those recommendations to our uh, department head, which is Kevin uh, Baines. And then uh, Kevin goes over them with us. And then we uh, go to the next step where we meet with uh, Carol Gilbert, who's uh, one of our assistant secretaries. And then from there, we meet with Secretary Holt to make those final recommendations. Once those uh, recommendations are approved, we go to the agreement, drafting, and execution process in which we uh, you know, take what you proposed uh, after we decide what we're going to fund or how we're going to fund it, we go through developing the agreement, which is really our contract with you on how you're going to spend the funds that are awarded. And then we start a execution process in which we send it to you for your review and signature. You send it back to us. We uh, send it through uh, a review by our legal department. It goes to our executive office for re final review and signature by Secretary Holt. And then once that's done, we get into the uh, active award management. That's where the award is live and you can begin to draw money. During that time, we're doing some award monitoring. So we're, you know, and that's done through the review of your quarterly reports, uh, site visits and the like. And then we close out the award after uh, a two year period. Uh, all of our grant agreements 
lasts for at least a two-year period, and we go through a closal process for that. So I know you're probably saying, where am I in this process? If you are a FY21 awardee, right now you're in the active award management process, uh, or you should be heading that way very soon. And so that means that we have already gone through the approvals. We've already gone through some agreement uh, drafting and execution. It's been signed by Secretary Holt, and now you're managing that award. So what does that mean? Well, when we talk about award management, we can really break down award management into three areas. There's uh, active award management in which we are uh, responding to your uh, request for payments, which is financial disbursements. Uh, there's quarterly reporting that's submitted by you, the awardee. And also there's regul regulatory requirements. Uh, if the award is over $250,000, we do have a NBE, WE, a WBE requirement. If it's under that, you don't have to worry about that. And so we're making sure that you are following the requirements that are set forth in the agreement. And then also we're doing monitoring. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we have not had a chance to really come back out to do site visiting. But uh, we come out and we visit and we uh, monitor the report that way. And um, I mean, the award that way. And also we do technical assistance. If you call and you have a question about um, if a particular thing uh, qualifies as a part of your award or how you should spend the money, or if you want to do a modified uh, agreement because something has changed since the uh, agreement has been executed, we will provide that in that um, area. And then finally, there's a closeout process in which we do uh, review of a final reporting and uh, monitoring and uh, tallying of your success indicators. Uh, did you meet your goals? If it was a facade program, did you do the uh, number of facades that you had identified that you would do? Uh, if it's final, uh, uh, have you spent all your entire award? We also look at that as well. And so we do a final monitoring where we will call you and uh, go through that with you. And also we do a financial reconciliation as well, uh, just uh, looking uh, at uh, the financials of the award, if the award was spent properly, uh, where all of the uh, required uh, support documentation submitted as well that would uh, support the use of the funds. Okay, and so the first thing we want to uh, go into is the award agreement. And so uh, the award agreement, uh, that is the document that we send to you that is basically our contract with you for the life of the award. And uh, we have some standard um, contract language that's a part of that award agreement. And then also we have some specific exhibits that are part of the agreement as well. In terms of in Exhibit A, we, we have your project description. Uh, we have the address or addresses that you've identified that are going to be part of the project. We identify your scope of work. Uh, we do a budget description talking about specifically how that money is going to be spent. And we also have a special condition section spelling out any particular uh, conditions that need to be met uh, either before money is uh, dispersed or before the end of the award agreement. You have your budget in there in Exhibit B, uh, the agreed upon budget uh, based on the award. And then also in the final exhibit, Exhibit C, we have a timeline. Usually that timeline is spread out over a two year period because that's the life of the grant cycle. And uh, we basically list uh, the things that you're going to be doing within that time period. All right, and so let's talk about awardee expectations. Now, uh, we sent out an email uh, that was generated by our system, probably, I think it was last week or so. And so uh, this might be a review for you and some for some of our uh, more uh, seasoned uh, awardees, you know, already know this, but for some of our new, you may not. So um, 
progress reporting. Progress reports are due quarterly. And so that's July 1, October 1st, January 1st, and April 1st. Okay, and so that's when our progress reports are due quarterly. Uh, normally, we, we give you a grace period of uh, five to seven business days with that. We ask that you uh, really make a strong effort to get your uh, quarterly, quarterly reports in on time. That's very important. That's the way that we can track and monitor the progress of the, um, pro uh, the project. And as well, we take what's in these reports and we do a larger uh, annual report that goes to uh, the deputy secretary and the secretary and others to see how the funds are being used. And so it's important that we get a clear picture on a quarterly basis of what you're doing with your projects. Um, usually final reports are due within 45 days of the project completion. And so uh, most of the um, grant awards run along the state of Maryland fiscal year. And so that is 7-1 through 6-30. And so after your project ends on 630, say like we're talking about FY21 awards right now, that means that your uh, grant agreement should end on 630-2023. And so you have 45 days after the completion of the project of the uh, grant agreement to submit a final report. Now, uh, at least, and we spelled this out in the grant agreement, at least 50% of the awarded funds should be drawn by the first anniversary of the award. And so that means that if you were awarded $50,000 for a facade improvement project, we would encourage you to spend at least 50% of that by within a year of having the project and so that's one of the things that we talk about in the application project uh, processes uh, that we like to see project uh, or shovel ready uh, projects we like to see projects that are ready to go as soon as the agreement is awarded and so uh, we uh, when we're awarded we're anticipating that you're ready to roll and sometimes in some instances you're not but uh, we understand that that may change but we strongly encourage that at least 50% of the award is spent within the first anniversary of the award execution. Now, uh, for payment requests, those are submitted via the um, IntelliGrant system. That is our, our project management system in which you submit um, all of your information and your requests and those things. Uh, we encourage each awardee to register or to sign up for electronic funds transfer or EFT. Uh, and that process seems to work a little bit quicker than uh, receiving paper checks. And so we do have that information for you of how you can sign up for that if you have not signed up for that already. And you know that cuts down on some of the delivery time in terms of payments. Since um, our money is for capital projects, except Bernie, Bernie has some money for operational as, as well as Ned, but the majority of our uh, programs are for capital projects. And because they are, you have to have a Maryland Historical Trust determination. And so we expect that, we expect that before you even get into the project, before you uh, spend money or ask for reimbursement that you already have the Maryland Historical Trust review and determination beforehand. Also, you should be in good standing with uh, SDAT and have up-to-date charity registration. And so that's very important as well. A lot of times we make that a condition, but they're not special conditions, that you are in good standing and you have up-to-date charity registration with the state if you are a nonprofit. If you're a local government, you don't have to worry about that. And of course, all records should be kept for a period of three years unless the award is a loan or what we call a grant loan combination or a groom, in which case the documents must be maintained uh, for the duration of the loan term. Okay. We have done loans in some instances for very large projects where we are awarding a large uh, sum of money 
not all of our awards are loans. And so only for those very large awards that are loans, you would know what to do. Um, in terms of setting up for the EFT vendor setup, you can go to the uh, controller's office online. That uh, address is marylandtaxes.gov, Maryland is in the state, marylandtaxes.gov forward slash divisions forward slash GAD. Again, that would Garland? be Maryland. Garland. Yes. You're stuck on the same PowerPoint. None of us can see what's going on. Okay. We've been stuck on the same and PowerPoint for a long I'm time. Actually, reading from another one. So, we... and, the, and people okay. are. Give us a second, and we're going to fix it. Thank you. So, All right. Can you can you send this to I'm us because we've missed so much? We are going to send it out. Thank you. Uh-huh, no problem. We're experiencing some technical difficulties, as you can imagine, in the training room. So we're going to um, sign on from a different computer, and hopefully it'll go more smoothly from there. All right. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Hopefully yes. you can. Yes. All right. Fantastic. All right. Uh, let me go back uh, just a, a, a page or two real quick, and I'm not going to go back deep. Um, again, we were talking about the award life cycle. We talked about how you know, uh, this is really viewed circularly. Um, that right now you're in the active award management process of the cycle, and what uh, award management meant in terms of financial disbursements, reporting, monitoring, and award closeout. And then we were talking about the award agreement in terms of uh, what the award agreement is and its exhibits. And so we were just talking briefly about expectations in terms of progress reporting. Uh, and those were the dates that the progress reports are due and that final reports are due within 45 days of the completion of the project. That all agreements, I mean, excuse me, that all projects should be completed within a two year uh, agreement execution date. That at least 50% of the award should be drawn within the first anniversary of the award execution. We were talking about encouraging you to um, register for electronic funds transfer for your payments instead of uh, receiving paper checks. Also, there's a Maryland Historical Trust determination that is required for capital projects before we can uh, reimburse you for them. That your organization, if you're a nonprofit, uh, 
uh, should be in good standing with SDAT and have up-to-date charity registration. And that if you are receiving a loan of the funds that uh, records should be, well, if you're receiving a grant, you know, you should keep the records at least three years. But if you're receiving a loan or a grant loan combination, you would keep your records up for the, entor the entire duration of the loan term. And this was how you could uh, get set up for the EFT vendor setup. And I'll leave this up for a minute. So this is where we really got to right now. And so if you go to that website right there, uh, you can get the information and complete it. And you would uh, email the complete application package to the uh, email address that's listed on the page, or you can fax it as well. And again, we're going to make the PowerPoint available to you. And so this information will be in the PowerPoint. Now, in terms of our program expectations, we do want to let you know that requests for payments are processed normally within 30 to 45 days. I know a lot of times you're uh, really anticipating you need quick turnaround, but normally our process takes at least from your submission to our approval to it going to the finance office and from being approved in finance to going to the controller for um, payment, it takes somewhere between 30 to 45 days. And so if you know you're going to be needing money by a certain period of time, you may want to get ahead and try to put your uh, request for payments in in a timely manner so you can not stress yourself or stretch yourself in terms of waiting for the funds. Our staff is available to provide technical assistance related to, you know, your project ideas, any sustainable uh, communities planning issues or questions, uh, general neighborhood revitalization improvements, and uh, statewide best practices. Also, we're able to advise you on uh, questions about eligible expenses and if you have a modification request. Now, modifications are if you're doing the agreement and you decide, well, we want to add another building uh, we, we receive money for one building, but we see another building we want to do as well, and we want to include that as part of our agreement. You could uh, send in a request to modify the agreement. We would review that, and it goes through a several-step review and approval process. I'm going to start right here. I wanted to hand it back over to Olivia because I, I'm not sure if Brian was going to talk about the request for payment process. Sure. And again, apologies for the technical difficulties that we're experiencing here. Um, if you want, Garland, I know I'd be able, I'd be happy to take over from here if you'd like. Um, I think sure. the thing, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go right ahead and just let me know when you uh, want me to advance the page. Okay, great. Um, we'll hold off and we'll have our grant system manager um, take over more at the end once we've gone through um, all of our program guidelines. Um, and then he will then be able to present and show how exactly to go through. Great, perfect. So Brian is, is ready to do a demo once we get to the end. Right. So I'll, I'll just take over from here for a moment if you'd like Garland and say that um, request for payments, again, very important to the award. Um, we do have to use our online project portal, which is listed there at our web address. Again, to, again if you're not already familiar um, and have a log on, we'll be able to provide you that information after the fact. In order to have a successful request for payment, a couple things need to be present. The first is that you do need to be current on a quarterly report submission. Um, there is a little bit of leeway depending on when your award was executed. Um, let's say it, it occurred after July 1, which is the beginning of our fiscal year, for example. Um, and, um, you know, the next you might not be required depending on when your grant agreement was executed. Um, I would say that's the only case. Otherwise, we will need to see a current quarterly report, you know, so that we can all kind of stay on board with the project and, and see progress. Um, 
Usually we do prefer a reimbursement to advance funds, although again, you'll have to talk to your project, regional project manager, um, you know, to be, be able to, um, you know, figure out if it's um, justified or not. If you do have a previous advance, um, you can either provide that supporting evidence or that supporting documentation before we would be able to process the next request, request for payment. In terms of an individual payment request, you know, we've kind of seen everything. We do prefer that the request for payment be over a certain amount, you know, between three and five thousand dollars is ideal. Again, depending on the award. Um, we, we prefer not to submit a request for payment in the amount of say five hundred dollars or so. But of course, again, we understand um, you know. Different projects call for um, different things, but we do encourage over that three thousand to five thousand dollar amount. You can't request funding, unfortunately, for activities that is outside of what's stated in your award agreement. So, you know, if you have that available, please take a look. Usually, it's specified within that Exhibit A and also possibly in Exhibit E in terms of the budget. Um, what are those eligible expenses? Like, for example. Um, if the grant agreement is to, um, you know, to let's say acquire a building, um, you might not be able to go through with demolishing that building unless you go through, as Garland explained, a modification process. So, I um, do want you to be aware of that. In terms of the supporting documentation that you'll have to attach, it does again. We do request that it's a reimbursement, um, in which case we'll need an invoice and also a canceled check um, to show evidence that it was paid for. Um, additional evidence that would, would qualify would be receipts, um, maybe your ledger, um, if there's an executed AIA contract or invoice. Um, usually we do have to also include the canceled check if you do provide that. Um, sales contracts, and so forth. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your regional project manager. The last thing I will say on this particular topic is that um, if your organization is acting as a sponsor or a pass-through um, for another organization, um, eventually we will need to see that check transferring funds from your organization um, back to that second organization. Um, we understand if that has to be, you know, you're not able to disperse those funds until that payment has been processed. Um, but eventually, you know, we'll have to see that maybe with your next request for payment. Can I say something too uh, before yeah. we move on to the next slide in supporting documentation as well? If you have a picture of the completed project, um, we would love that if you can attach that as well. Great, thanks, Arlen. Mm -hmm. So as Garland mentioned previously, we do distinguish between capital and operating activities. And depending on your project and the funds that you've been awarded, you'll know um, whether or not you've been awarded capital or operating funds. Uh, Bernie, for FYA 2021, um, some of you do have operating funds. And again, it'll be denoted differently within the budget section of your um, agreement. Capital is what we consider bricks and sticks, and that's the majority of our projects. So community legacy, for example, is strictly capital, um, you know, C, NED, um, a lot of Bernie for the most part of capital. And that is, you know, land, you know, acquisition, structures, um, anything related to construction. Usually it has a 15 year shelf life. Um, we do consider architectural engineering drawings um, as capital. Um, unfortunately, feasibility market studies are not considered part of capital, um, but we do consider some um, planning or design um, that kind of lead to the harder um, costs of construction. So again, 
any questions um, can br be brought to your uh, regional um, project manager. We do have, we do use as a guidebook um, something that's published by Department of General Services related to their bond um, bond projects. Um, we don't follow their guidelines exactly, but it might give you a good kind of start um, to see what would be eligible on the capital. In terms of operating, usually it's what you would think of, you know, as an everyday operating cost, um, cost associated with day-to-day -day operations, maybe it's staff costs, um, feasibility or planning studies, marketing, um, and so forth. Um, usually it does not last 15 years. Um, usually these are types of things that can be moved around or is not directly related to real property. Um, and, and so, for example, in Burmey, um, you know, it could be like staff operating costs would be um, the project under that specific fund. Geographic location. Um, just quickly here, just in terms of our projects, they should be located within a sustainable community. That is an, an eligibility requirement. Usually, you've already gone through this process. Um, an example of programs where some um, addresses have not already been identified, it might be helpful to, um, you know, just take a look and make sure it's within your sustainable community area. Things like if it's a facade improvement program or the addresses are, have not yet been identified, that would be an instance where you might want to look up that geographic location. We do have a mapper for that as well. Listed on that slide. Thanks, Darwin. And just to say quickly, um, for project four um, awards that you may have, um, there might be additional address level reporting. Um, so please heed any communication from um, our program officer, Nick Mayer, who runs the project four program. Site control, Marlon, I don't know if I should shoot it back over to you. Sure. Uh, site okay. control, yeah, no problem. Site control, this is very important. And um, if there's anything that could hold up the execution of an agreement is the, the termination of site control. And so um, site control is the demonstration of uh, ownership. And so you have to show some type of, what we say legal nexus that you own the site that you have proposed to do the work on. Now, I know you're saying, well, I have a facade improvement program. I, how does that work? Because I don't own the buildings that I'm doing a facade improvement on. Well, we like to see that you have some type of MOA or MOU uh, with those building owners of those particular buildings that you've identified for your facade improvement program that shows that, yes, uh, they are granting you permission to uh, use funds for the improvement of their building. And so uh, proof of site control is required for any project that's involving uh, acquisition, demolition, construction, or rehab. And it's required at the time of the execution of the agreement. And so it could come from uh, the person with legal interest in the property or the owner. Now, um, a lot of times what we do in terms of evidence of site control, you see these things that are listed. And so uh, SDAT, that could, uh, SDAT printout of uh, showing that the property is owned by the awardee, um, that could be used, a letter from the property owner uh, to the awardee, a document that links the awardee, like I mentioned, the MOU or MOA, uh, any lease agreements or purchase agreements. Say if you're doing an acquisition and you have the closing disclosure or the HUD-1, that would also uh, qualify as evidence of site control. I'm not sure if Melissa's on the line or not. Melissa, are you on the line? Yes, yes, I am. Would you like to talk about uh, historical trust review real quick? 
Um, sure. I'll, I'll let you put me on the spot. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're, you're fine. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Melissa Archer. I am the Historic Preservation Officer for the Division of Neighborhood Revitalization. And so my role here is to coordinate our compliance with the Maryland Historical Trust Act. And that's a state law that requires state agencies to consult um, with the Maryland Historical Trust, which is our state historic preservation office, on the potential impacts our projects will have on historic and cultural resources. And so a question I get a lot is, um, you know, do we have to do this for small projects or if it's not a historic building? And the easy answer is that we have to do it for everything that's capital. So unless the project is operating, um, it, it's not, uh, it's something that we can waive that requirement. The only exemption that we have is um, that pre-development work that Olivia mentioned. Um, A and E is something that we do not have to um, do reviews for because it's you know technically you could do plans in A and E and it wouldn't you know if those plans fall through, no historic buildings are harmed, and so that's the only exemption that we have. So. With that, I will. Oh, sorry. I think I skipped right. something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went off on a tangent about exemptions. Um, yeah. Could you go back one slide? Yeah. Yeah. I think there was probably some more important stuff here. Okay. Yes. So uh, we do highly, highly, highly re recommend that you reach out to us as soon as possible if your project is imminent or underway. Um, the trust, it's their policy that they do not review projects after the fact and so if you have a project that's already completed and we try to initiate a consultation with the trust we're out of luck they they will reject it and, and not provide any kind of comment for us and so we want to emphasize the importance of doing the preservation consultation as early in your planning process as possible particularly if you have a project that could potentially harm historic resources. And um, I'll touch on that in a little bit. So um, again, early, early, early. And also, please provide us with information if by any chance your project is also receiving funds from other state agencies or uh, federal agencies, because we don't want to duplicate our efforts. And so since we're all agencies are um, required to comply with this law, if another agency has already done it, we can accept that. So if your project has a bond bill, if you got DNR funding or um, like a historic African-American cultural grant, a heritage area grant, all of those other public sources um, that I just mentioned the state funding, but there's CDBG, um, home funds, all, you know, all the HUD programs, you know, let us know because again we don't want to duplicate efforts and so if it can expedite things for you to provide us with a pre-existing review we will gladly accept that and um, also so i'm the historic preservation officer um, i coordinate that review so please work with me do not uh, circumvent the process and, and go directly to the trust that just adds confusion and they will just bump it right back to us um, we are really lucky that we are one of the few state agencies that we have a programmatic agreement in place with the trust that designates review authority to the preservation officer here. And so it's really in your best interest to work directly with me because most of the time we can review it internally in our office and we don't even have to involve the trust unless uh, potential harm to historic buildings is proposed. So um, the process in the next slide will detail exactly how to initiate the review. And, and so uh, what we ask you to do is uh, send an email and you can send it directly to Melissa and copy your project manager. Make sure that you put the project name and address in the subject line of the email. Also, please reference the award number. We ask that you send before photographs that uh, are representative of the uh, proposed project, including exterior and interior, if applicable. Uh, we want a narrative or the uh, contractor's proposal that summarizes the scope of work. 
uh, any conceptual plans, renderings, construction plans, uh, specifications, product cut sheets, et cetera. Those are um, work as well, project budget sheet, your cost estimates, contracts. And also make note of whether the project is subject to review from a federal agency, as Melissa has already kind of touched on, if you're getting these other sources of funds, you may have also done some other type of uh, reviews as well. So we can coordinate that with those different uh, pots of funding. Um, I mentioned this uh, in passing a little bit earlier. Uh, we do require your uh, minority and women business enterprise plan if the awarded project is greater than $250,000 and it's not for uh, acquisition use and development includes one large site, a cluster of buildings and or scattered sites, and there's one general contractor developer that's engaged in the project. Okay, and so if you meet any of those criteria, then you would have to submit a MBE WBE plan. And you can um, work with your uh, regional project manager uh, just to determine if you are in alignment with it and what you need to do. Uh, disclosing conflicts of interest. Uh, we ask that you, you know, disclose any conflicts or potential conflicts of interest and uh, that you should have some type of conflict interest policy. Uh, we don't need a copy of the policy, but you should be able to uh, produce it upon request. And uh, like, for instance, sometimes we've gotten this uh, just, you know, uh, maybe over the last couple of fiscal years of where like I give you an example of a facade program and they have a review board and there may be people that on the review board that may also apply to receive a facade improvement award. So we ask that you disclose those conflict of interest. That's a, that's a, a, a real good example. And so there's some other uh, examples in, in terms of um, you know, operating support or potential conflict with members who should not be part of the decision making process and things like that. And so if you have any particular conflicts of interest, we just ask that you have a policy that you follow. And if um, we need to ask you for a copy of it, that you'll be able to provide it for us. Loans. Uh, I know uh, Melissa is tracking our loans. I'm not going to ask her to say anything again. But what I'm going to say is this, though. If the award is made as a loan or a grant loan uh, with conditional loan terms, there are some additional requirements. And so uh, it can be made directly to the borrower via, uh, via a loan agreement. Uh, sometimes the loan can be done indirectly through an eligible awardee and passed through as a sub-recipient loan. And sometimes we have special conditions in terms of uh, execution of a promissory note and assignment back to uh, DHCD should the project be completed at a time of the award execution or prior to the first financial disbursement. And we ask that you keep records during the duration of the loan term. And so we do track the loans within our internal process. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't give, we don't do loans on every type of project. There are some projects uh, for the large amount of award, we may uh, seek to do a loan or a grant with loan type of terms. And so uh, we work very closely with our Office of the Attorney General uh, in developing those uh, promissory notes and assignments. And we work with your uh, legal team as well in the crafting of those agreements. Uh, some best practices. Uh, make sure you contact your regional project manager with any questions or concerns. That's what they're there for. And so uh, any questions come up, please link with them. And they should be able to, if they don't have the immediate answer, they should be able to find the answer and help you address any of your concerns. Uh, at the time of the award execution, if there's any uh, special conditions that need to be addressed, you know, make sure that you address those in terms of certificate of good standing, 
uh, if they're particularly if it's a loan and there's some particular loan documents that have to be in place before a first disbursement of funds. We ask that you try to work on those. And so at the time of execution, we can go right through and you can begin to access those funds. Uh, and so, you know, also we want to make sure that as uh, Melissa suggested, if you know this is a capital project in which you're going to have to have a MHT determination uh, or you're going to need to make sure that your sustainable communities plan is in order or you need to have site control. Try to, you can start working on those things now uh, before you even get to the point of uh, seeking a disbursement of the funds. And also prior to subsequent uh, disbursements, we want to make sure if you ask for an event that you uh, provide us with evidence to support your events. And there are, uh, are occasions that we do uh, give advances on projects, but uh, we ask that we get that support documentation before you request any additional funds so we can make sure that we've uh, resolved that. Make sure that you're staying current with your quarterly reporting and making sure that your MHT and sustainable community and site control things are all in place. Also consider a process for collecting and submitting address related scope information. Uh, like for example, um, if you have a facade program and the application requires address and description and scope of work and things like that, uh, make sure that you, you know, you're keeping a good track of those things. And so when you submit for a request for a payment, you, you probably have a, a good decent record of those properties that have received funding. Olivia, um, I'm going to pass it back to you to talk about closeout. Great. Thanks, Arlen. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to dwell on this um, too much. I know we need to move on um, to get to the project portal and, and so forth. But just to say quickly, um, there is a point, you know, when we are, are complete with our active award management where your project is complete, um, at least the phase that we're involved in, and the funds have been um, fully spent down. Um, at that point, it is considered complete. And at that point, we will need your final report, which is due within 45 days, um, as stated in Exhibit C of your grant agreement. The final report goes into some additional questions. Uh, so it's a little bit more detailed than the quarterly report. Um, but hopefully, you know, you've been tracking some things along the way, um, so it's, it's not too uh, burdensome to put together. And then at that point, we will then be able to move forward with what we call a final monitoring and our closeout process. And then, again, final monitoring being either in-person site visit or quote and review. There are some specific questions that we have to ask. Um, but, you know, mostly it's just a check-in on how the project went and what are some ways um, that, um, you know, could be done differently next time or if there are any other um, ideas for projects in your community um, that need to get done. And also, the process also includes the financial reconciliation, um, making sure, you know, all the advanced, you know, if there have been advanced funds that all the evidence um, has been submitted to DHCD and so forth. Um, and once everything is sent in and everything looks to be good, the department will then send out a closeout letter. The other thing I did want to mention is that um, we do have a current backlog of awards to close out, so we might be reaching out to you or your organizations in the near future regarding closeout of some past awards. Before we get into questions, I was hoping we could toss over to Brian Holtzapel, who is our grant system manager. Um, hopefully he can um, share his screen. Maybe while we wait, um, I see Ms. Adrian has a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Jermaine, can you step outside? 
My question is, um, our first grant was, and I'm sorry, we got activity going on in here. Um, our first grant was um, for acquisition. And I kind of remember seeing that when I was doing the grant agreement and everything on the platform that I didn't have any reports to. So in an act like us, we just did an acquisition of, of property. Are reports due, are quarterly reports due, or is that for when you have a full, um, you know, project of rehab or construction or demolition? I can answer that. Um, again, depending on when your grant agreement was executed, um, there might not have been an opportunity to um, do a quarterly report. However, it doesn't matter the type of activity, whether it be acquisition or rehabilitation. For all of our projects, either capital or operating, we do require quarterly reports. Um, so again, let's say your agreement was executed in between um, the last quarterly report, let's say, for example, July 1 and October 1, um, you would be then required to, you know, you might have been able to get that disbursement um, since your award was not active at the July 1 mark. Um, but it could be that by the time October 1 rolls around, you'll have to either submit a um, quarterly report if the project is continuing or a final report um, if you fully disperse your funds. Okay, thanks. That makes sense. Great, thanks. And um, we'll answer one more question and then Brian, you can take over. So I see that um, Ms. Nancy, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I've had um, issue for the last month that um, I have 2017, which has been gone a long time ago, two of them in my task bar, and then one for 2020. But my 2021 that I'm actively working on is not in my task bar. And I know they've been trying to resolve it for about a, a, at least a couple weeks. Hey, hey, Liv, this is Brian. I can address this. Uh, Nancy is, is uh, somewhat new to using the system, and uh, I will be demonstrating here uh, how you access documents and okay. how you start new ones. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to cover here in just a second. Thank, thanks, Brian. I mean, I don't need to, I, 2017 anymore. <laughs> I well, appreciate that. And, and I'll, I'll speak to that, too, because um, the task box is kind of a key thing, and... Uh, and we'll see how that works here in a moment. Oh, appreciate your help. Thank you. So I guess with that said, um, it's it it's now uh, the, the the ball has been passed to me, and I am sharing a screen here. Now this is the test site. This is our sandbox, but it's an exact replica of the live site, the DHCD project portal uh, that you would access with the address that was provided. Uh, so you should have an account in the system to be able to manage your award. Uh, if you happen to be a, a new employee with your organization that you work with and, and got invited to this uh, or tagged along on this presentation and don't have an account, uh, we would encourage you to go to the main site, the main page, and register. Uh, there's, a, there's a button there next to the login uh, windows where you put in your username and password. It says new user question mark. If you happen to be brand new, never been in the system, you can click that, register, we'll take care of you, get you set up, get you assigned. If you are a returning user, do not create a new account. If you uh, just happen to forget your username or password, reach out to your project manager. Reach out to your regional project manager. They can either help you with a reset or they'll pass it along to one of uh, the system administrators like myself uh, to provide that assistance and we can get you back in the system and back online. We don't. What we don't wanna do is create a bunch of duplications of accounts and then you have you know, some some awards under one account and other awards under another account and you can't find anything. It's just a mess. You don't want to do that. Uh, so that's kind of a preface thing. I kind of skipped ahead to the I'm already logged into the system here. And when you do log in, this is your home page. So this is what you see. And, uh, you know, I'm going to call attention to uh, right under, you know, you're welcome, Ryan, right under your name. It has the role 
that you are given in the system. And that role determines what you can see, when you can see it, and what you can do, and when you can do it. Uh, there are principally three roles that users from award organizations, awarded organizations will see. It's either a legal entity official, and that tends to be your, your CEO or your um, director or what have you. Uh, as an authorized official who could also be the director or CEO, or it might be someone who for, for whom that is delegated. Uh, and those two roles have what we would consider to be electronic signature authority. Uh, so it's those two roles that are permitted to submit forms. That includes requests for payments and quarterly reports. The third common role you may see is called a project administrator. And that is someone who works for your organization, might fill out the paperwork, but does not have the signature authority to submit the form on behalf of the awardee. If you happen to be a project administrator, you will be able to create a form, you'll be able to fill it out, that is to say a request for payment or a quarterly report, but you're gonna get to the end and you're gonna try to submit and it won't let you. And it won't let you because the system doesn't recognize you as being authorized to sign that paperwork electronically on behalf of your awardee. So if that is the case, if you find that you're a project administrator in the system and you shouldn't be, either because your boss has delegated the authority to you or what have you, again, reach out to your regional project manager, let them know the circumstance, say, hey, I'm supposed to be authorized to submit these forms. And uh, once again, that'll get to a system administrator. We can get you squared away. But I wanted to bring that up front because it's one of the most common questions I have received is someone who goes in and says, well, I don't see a submit button. That's why. <laughs> because you're not listed in the system as having the authorization to submit. So I am on my home page. I am Brian and I am an authorized official. And I am going to say, all right, well, it is, let's, okay, it's, we're in November now, but let's say it was the beginning of October and I know I've got a report due. How am I going to create that quarterly report uh, to fill out and to submit? Well, unfortunately and not intuitively, you're not going to find it under my award progress reports. Why? Well, because it hasn't been created yet. If I were to go to this search tab and search for quarterly reports, it'll show me any one that I have filled out to date, but it cannot show me one I haven't started yet. So in order to create a brand new report, what I need to do is to bring up the application record, the award record, the application record. And the easiest way to do that is to go under the My Application Search tab. And here I've already selected the, the uh, application year. This is a state revitalization programs, community legacy, seed, core, Bernie, NEDS, and it's for fiscal year 21. This is what I wanna find. I'm gonna hit search. And it's gonna show me all of the applications and awards that I have for this fiscal year 21 round. I wanna do a report for this active award. It happens to be a seed. So I'm gonna click on the ID of that award and it's gonna bring me to the main page of that application slash award. Now here, I can check, I can click view forms if I need to refresh my memory onto what, what this award was all about. It says it was a SDF project. Uh, and uh, you know I can look, revise, re refresh my memory on the application. I also have access, and this is new for fiscal year 21 and going forward, I have now access to a page called Award Summary. And what this page does that becomes visible when your award becomes active is it just gives you a summary of your award to date, where it's at. So it's got information like the start date, the end date, uh, the program, the primary address related to the project. It's got uh, your project regional project manager contact info on it. It's got the financial information, how much of the award was capital, how much was operating. It also has links on here to the award letter that was sent to you when it was awarded. And once we do receive your executed agreement signed by yourselves and by our secretary and the award becomes active, we upload it into the system and you have access to a copy of your agreement here as well, should you need it or can't find it on your own records. So uh, this is a place where you can get that stuff if you need to reference what's in the agreement, particularly the project scope, the addresses, the budget, you have it right here at your fingertips. 
if we do any kind of amendments, they would also appear here as a similar link, like an extension or something to that effect. Uh, and then below that, we have links to reporting. So what this will do is you can pull up at any time an award payment report. This, by clicking on this link, it'll pop open a little PDF and it'll show you any request for payments you've made against this award to date. There is also a link here to show the most recent progress report submitted. So I happen to be going in to make my first one here, I think. But if I had already done one, this you know, say this is January and I'd already submitted my October, there'd be a link here to generate the last one I submitted. And again, that's just as a refresher to see what I did last, where we were at. This stuff is now available to you all on one page underneath the application. underneath the forms on this page called award summary. So that's great. Now I refresh my memory. I know what I'm doing. I want to create the report. To create a new report or a request for payment, I have to go under this section, examine related items. Under this section, what we will see is anything we've submitted to date related to this award. So RFPs, quarterly reports, final report, that kind of thing. It'll show you what status it's in. It'll show you what happened to it. It'll show you when you last submitted it, when it was last edited and by whom. And if you want, you can click on the ID links and it'll pop open the record and you could drill down even deeper. But if I want to create a new one, this is what I'm looking to, is these initiate links that appear at the top of this page. If I want to create a new request for payment, I click this link, let it run its little cycle, and it creates a new request for payment. This would be number three in the order. And I can go in, click View Forms, fill out the one pager which is also a little new for 2021. We have streamlined a lot of these forms starting in 2021. So what used to be maybe two or three pages long, we, we boiled it down to just a single page now. So you'll fill out the request for payment form, you'll submit it, we'll receive it, we'll process it. And when it's approved, you'll be notified of the approval. I think it's been stated before in the presentation earlier that when we do our processing, it moves to the next step to finance and it takes you know, finance and treasury uh, to issue payment. So it can take you know, 30 days to, to actually receive the payment. And as Garland had mentioned earlier, signing up for the electronic funds transfer uh, is of course a much quicker result than waiting on a paper check. And I'm not going to go into the uh, details of filling out the request for payment form. We have linked here a, a training document that takes you through step by step uh, and has already been said we're going to be sending out after this presentation is done and they're able to uh, provide or, or get the link to the recorded training and the PDF of the PowerPoint. We'll also throw in there the PDFs of training on how to fill out a request for payment. Uh, that PDF document will be attached as well as the PDF document on how to do a quarterly report. So the RFP is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not going to drill into the details, but I will call out that on the RFP form, there is also the opportunity to provide us with information about the addresses where the activities related to this request are occurring. So it gives you yet another chance to tell us these are the addresses where the activity is taking place. Clearly, it is something that we need to report on to other levels of government. And so we're paying kind of a closer attention to that than we maybe had in the past. And it's a question we've added into our forms over the, just the last few years. There is also the opportunity to provide uh, site control or MHT documents related to the, uh, the, uh, the payment. If you hadn't already, it's been stated before, this, these things should be in place before you actually do activities, but if you, if you know you're going to be working on the next thing coming up soon and you have the documentation here and you're ready to put in a request for payment for a previously finished activity, go ahead and slap it into the RFP because then we receive it. And when the RFP gets reviewed by the project manager, aha, we've got it. We can put it where it needs to go.
Brian, are you able to click into that form just so that sure. we can look? Yeah, sure. Um, this form <laughs> isn't quite as, um, what do I want to say, specified in that regard. Uh, as, as say the quarterly report form is, and I'll, I'll show you that in a little more detail. But in terms of the RFP, we really only have uh, the upload section for the evidence related to the payment request. So, you know, in far, as far as uploads go. So this is what uh, Olivia was speaking to earlier in, in terms of uh, eligible evidence of, of, of expenditures. And below that, we have this address verification business. So again, just tell us what addresses these activities related to this payment request occurred at. Uh, we've got a link to the mapper site here. If you needed to pull up the mapper site to see it on a map, you can provide us with copies of that map. And that, again, verifies that the address is mappable and it shows that it did occur within the sustainable community as, as was specified in the award. And so, you know, this this page in particular doesn't call out site control or MHT in 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 the specifics because it's not necessarily um, intended for that. But it is an opportunity if you're delivering stuff to us anyway, uh, related to a payment request, and you happen to have it on hand and you hadn't yet reported it, you can throw it in here as well as an attachment uh, as an additional attachment. And, uh, and then it gets to our hands and we're able to check it against the activities and put it on your award record and so forth. And Brian, where do folks put in their requests? Ah, sure. Uh, so this is a request for payment. Um, it's gonna, it shows me that you know my award was 210,000. Thus far, this much has been dispersed, meaning I put in requests for it and they've been approved. Uh, and that's my current balance. Uh, let's just say I'm doing this one as a reimbursement. How much am I asking for on this payment? Let's just say 10K. What follows then is a table demonstrating uh, the award budget. And uh, the this award budget is carried over from your agreement. And this is a bad example because it's a test record and I've got numbers all over the place. But uh, what you could do is you would just put in uh, the payment request amount against the line item of your award budget for which it should get charged. And then you'd upload any evidence documentation related to the payment. You'd give us a little description about the attachments, about the payment, what it went for. Again, type in the address that it was related to. Provide map documentation if necessary. And then give your name, title, email, phone number in case we need to reach out to you and have any questions about this payment request. Do not forget to hit the save button. You get all the way down to the bottom here, and it's very, very enticing and very exciting to just go ahead and press this green button. But if you do that without saving the page, it's going to take you to the next page, and it's not going to save your data. So if you type stuff in, hit the save button. You know, hit it many times, but make sure you hit it before you click the green button. I'm going to go back to my main award here and go back to related items. I'm going to start a new report. So I'm going to click to initiate a quarterly report. Oh, I already have one in process. This is a test record, and this is a good demonstration of what I was going to talk about. And I'm glad this came up. The system will only allow you to have one quarterly report record in process, meaning created, but not yet submitted. It will only let you have one at a time. The same is true for requests for payment. If I had started a request for payment like I did a moment ago, and I hadn't yet submitted it, which I didn't, and I go and try to create another one, I'm going to get another error like this that says, hey, you already got one started. Go finish or edit that one 
submit that one before you start a new one. So the system is telling me I already have a quarterly report record in process. All right, cool. I'll hit back. And if I go back to that related items page again, where I can see all of the records, I see quarterly report in process. There it is, that one. That one was started. It needs to be filled out before a new one can be done. So as mentioned before, we've got an attachment here for the training PDF, and it, again, steps you through the pages of the report. Here, too, it used to be like two or three pages, the quarterly reports from fiscal years 18, 19, 20. Uh, the 21 and going forward, we condensed it down to one page. Well, two, one plus an attachments and sign off. And the form begins with just, again, basic general info about your award. Here, too, are similar links like I showed you on the award summary page that we saw on the, the primary award record. You got a link to your payment activity. You've got a link to uh, your previous pro progress report. So this was the last one submitted prior to this one. Uh, you've got a link to your award agreement if you need to reference it. Uh, and if there were any amendments, they would also have links here. Uh, it's a reminder of the reporting periods and the due dates. So again, like the 1st of January, give or take a couple business days, 1st of April, 1st of July, 1st of October, and you're reporting on the activities that occurred in the prior three months. So you tell us which report this is. I'm going to say this is for January, January of 22. And then it asks you, is this your final report? This is also new for 2021. Prior to this year, the final report was a completely separate thing. You had to create it separately. You had to initiate it separately from your standard quarterly report. Again, in the interest of condensing the workflow, the workload on everyone, we said, well, why don't we just kind of meld them together? And so it asks you, is this your final report? And if you say yes, check the box and hit save. Let it do its thing. It's going to give me three more pages to fill out as part of this submission. So a standard quarterly report is going to have just the progress report form and the attachments and authorization. But if I say this is my final report, I get three extra pages to fill out as part of that complete report. The report itself, the, for all you know, all progress reports, this form it asks you know what are the activities that occurred in the last period? Are you on target to complete the project? How are the funds used? Have you had any problems, any obstacles? Yes or no? And if you say yes, you can tell us what they were. Uh, we ask you to look at your payment activity. Are you on track to meet that 50% drawdown requirement within the first 12 months? Yes or no? If you say no. Let us know what's going on. You know, why we're, we're, did, did a deal fall through or is it delayed in acquisition payment? You know, who knows? But if you don't think you're going to make that target, if you haven't made that target, you can tell us why. And your project manager can maybe assist you in, in getting the, the ball rolling here. Did you request any payments or advances as advances? The, the payment report will show you if it was an advance. It'll have a letter A marked on it. And if you see that, well, then, okay, we had some advances, and it says, uh, yeah, yeah, I had some advances. Uh, and then it prompts you, if you hadn't yet submitted evidence related to that advance payment, gives you a chance to send it to us through your report. Uh, so it, that's been brought up before. It's certainly a requirement to be able to close an award, uh, to consider it complete. Any advance payments that still have outstanding evidence uh, would need to be collected as part of your quarterly reports or as your final part of your final report so that we can put a bow on it, say, yep, we're good. Asks about special conditions. This is text that appears in your agreement under Exhibit A. 
uh, and these are things that you might have to do as part of your, or that you would have to do as part of your agreement. Uh, in many cases, it's about having certificate of good standing or evidence of SDAT. It's, it might be about uh, having site control for every property included. Uh, there might be other things depending on what the nature of the project is. And so it displays here for you what the current terms of your award are, your special conditions, uh, and you answer if you've met them yes or no. If you haven't been able to meet them yet, uh, then you can provide an explanation as to why. The next section is MHT. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, capital projects almost always require that at least, you know, the, the properties be determined whether to need an MHT review, comes through us, comes through Melissa Archer. It will, the system will now show you uh, what we have on record to date. So these were the, the documents related to this award that have been previously submitted, maybe with the application if you had it ahead of time, maybe with the agreement while you were working on that process, maybe in a prior quarterly report. We collected it, we, we passed it through Melissa, and you know we got the determinations. The, the so anything that we have on record related to this award, related to MHT is gonna show up here. You can view it if you need to, or if you can see that, ah, okay, well, these are the addresses that thus far they have, but I've got another address and I don't see the MHT on here. So this is my chance to throw it on here and submit it to me or to us, to DHCD, to your project manager as part of the report. Same with site control. Here we've got listed the site control documents that we have on file right now for this award. You're filling out your report. Oh, look, I've got another one that's not here. Here's your chance to send it to us. Minority Business Enterprise, Women's Owned Business Enterprise, uh, MBEWEE, -E, that was mentioned too. Um, this is related to if you had any consultants or contractors working on the project. This data populates based on what was provided at the time of your application. Obviously, that was a long time ago. So if that information has changed, here's your chance to tell us, nope, I got another consultant. I got a different contractor. I can edit this uh, as, as necessary. The final report has a few extra special narrative questions uh, pertaining to uh, completed activity, community impact, um, pretty much stuff that's on the existing uh, final report, but it's it's been moved here and condensed. Record keeping, photographs. That's one of the things we definitely need if you hadn't done it already, you know, here, you gotta send us some completed project photos. Address verification, again, we keep hammering away at this address stuff. So we say, we tell you, okay, well, these are the addresses you told us, or the, or to date, to date you've told us these are the addresses related to the project. And here's your chance to provide us with any edits. Uh, you know, nope, I've got another address that's not here, or nope, this address uh, can go away. Uh, so you can edit this and save it and submit it back to us and we can maintain our internal records related to this address information. As was noted, there might be extra stuff needed for CORE, uh, but again, contact Nick Mayer, uh, who, who coordinates the, the CORE program uh, for the team. And if everything checks out on the address stuff, you can just click the checkbox. No changes, we're good, just click the checkbox, we're done. The last page of the final report, well, exclusively final report, is this impact data. And this is some statistical information. Again, this was what, what comes in here initially is what was submitted at the time of application. Of course, those were proposed. So now that the project's done, you can look through at what you reported to us at the application stage, and you can edit this as necessary to match the completed project. What, what, what's the reality now that it's done? On the last page, and this, this page again appears both in your standard quarterly report, but also as part of the final report, we have some attachments and authorizations. So 
we talked about a little bit. They talked about uh, MBE and WBE. Uh, there's some information here about it. It's applicable to capital projects greater than 250K. So if it doesn't apply to your project, it doesn't apply to your project. But if you're awarded more than 250K in capital funding, this is something you should be paying attention to. Uh, we have a link here on what the policy guidelines are. And we have two links here to a Word document form and an Excel document form uh, that collects the information. Well, that's a test site. Yep, sorry. That collects the information related to MBE reporting. So you can fill out those templates and you can attach them here. Uh, now this is something you can do on the quarterly. So if you do it once and, and you submit it to us and we got it and there are no changes, great, we have it, we're good. Uh, if you hadn't done it yet, here's a chance to do it. Below that is just other another space for any other general supporting documents. So if this is the quarterly report or even if it's the final report, if you have any other you know photographs you want to send to us along the way, published materials, press releases, web articles, anything else that might be related to the project that you want to submit as evidence of the activities. And then it just ends with your sign off. So your authorizing name, title, email, phone number. Again, hit the save button before you go to hit the submit. Make sure you save your work or else you're, it's gonna throw you some errors. So, I mean, that is really the crash course on filling out both, you know, kind of an RFP and a quarterly, a quarterly progress report or final report. Um, I didn't go into elaborate detail, but it is detailed, in, at least from a technical standpoint, detailed in those PDF instructions. And of course, any programmatic questions, uh, well, what do I need to report for this type of project? Uh, does this qualify? Is this, do I need this for that? Those are exactly the type of questions that your regional project manager would love to hear. So that is as far as it goes for my crash course demo. Uh, I'm going to kick it back. Stop presenting. At least try. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, I know we've been getting a lot of questions on that, so it's helpful to hear um, and get that demonstration. So thanks again. Am I still present? I don't see it anymore. Did I stop presenting already? Yeah, you stopped presenting. Oh, good. So I know we're a little over time, but I know there's some questions out there. Um, I think preferably put your questions in the chat, but I do see Mr. Jordan, your hand is still raised from earlier. So I wanted to, um, to get you first. Sure. Okay. Sure, thank you. I was actually just about to type it in, so you're very efficient. Thank you for remembering. Um, real quick, so I don't believe I submitted a quarterly report. So if I, when I submit my next quarterly report, should it cover the three months or the six months? Make sense? So if you miss a quarterly report, um, should you include, should they be counted as two? So you combine two into one, or do you just want to one and then submit another one that's a great question um if you miss um a previous deadline we ask that you actually submit two quarterly reports so the first one would okay. you know, cover the first three months and then the next one would cover right. the next three months got you got you okay i got you thank you great thanks Hey, Liv. Yes. Uh, I think this might address at least one of the questions that's pending, and it's something I forgot to do in the demo. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to present real quick here again because I forgot to talk about the My Task window. Sure. Uh, so it had been mentioned, and I talked about navigating to create new things. Anything that has not yet been submitted or 
if it was returned to you, project manager received your submitted RFP or received your submitted quarterly report and found something either wrong with it or the information was incomplete, they may return it to you. Uh, and if they do, you get an email notification. It lets you know, hey, this was sent back to you for revision. But anything that is in your hands, so to speak, something that you're supposed to do with it is going to show up under my tasks. This is a window that appears at the bottom of your home page. So when you're logged into your home page, if you see you have tasks, then that's telling you you started some forms that you haven't submitted yet. So or or we're returned to you. So if I click open, I'm going to have this window and I'm going to see these records here. So I've got a quarterly report in process. That's the one we just created, but we hadn't submitted yet. I've got a request for payment in process that I created during that demo, haven't yet finished or submitted. Uh, as someone had brought up earlier, what if I see stuff that's several years old? Well, that probably means that it was submitted by someone else some time ago related to an older award and it was returned. It's going to tell you the status that it's in. And if it says quarterly report clarifications required or requested, that's telling you it was sent back to you for revision. Uh, same with re request for payment modifications required that it was sent back to you for a correction uh, now depending on how long ago that happened if it's been sitting in your box for a while and you just need to do some housekeeping i highly recommend you reach out to your project manager talk to them about hey i've got this record in here i've got this in here i've got this in here i don't know what to do with them they've been here for a while what what do i need to do to fix them and get them back to you so you know, there's there's a housekeeping opportunity for you when you sit down to do your next report to maybe clear out your inbox, clear out your task box. And so again, anything not yet submitted by you that has either been started, not yet submitted, or returned to you for correction is going to show up in your My Tasks window. So hopefully that um, that caught some of it. Great, thanks, Brian. Uh, before you get off, there is a question related to the system. Um, it's a technical related to PDFs. Mm. So somebody has attempted to download a PDF, but then there's an error that comes up, fails, network error. Yeah, OK. So the nature of the problem is that our system is very old, and it operates on an old server. Uh, it works best, particularly with PDF generation, like clicking on that print version link uh, that you may see in the forms menu if you want a print version for your records of these forms. Uh, the PDF generation in particular fails uh, with newer web browsers. Uh, and so at this time, it is highly recommended that you, if you are at all able, to download and install the old Microsoft Internet Explorer version 11. Uh, if you do a Google search, Microsoft Internet Explorer 11, you'll be able to find a download for it. It's a free download. You can install it. Some of you in your offices may have network things that you're not allowed to. You can get by on just about absolutely everything else on newer browsers like Chrome and Edge and so forth. Uh, but but that PDF generation is the one sticking point. The if If you're unable to get the print version you need, uh, send a request to uh, your regional project manager. One of us can generate it for you and send it back to you if necessary. Uh, but in 99 out of 100 times, that's what's happening is that it's the, the old server, the old system uh, that does not play well uh, with newer versions of web browsers, particularly when it comes to the PDF stuff. Uh, good news is that is being rectified. And uh, within the next mm, within the next calendar year, probably late summer, August sometime, uh, we will be migrating to a new server and an updated version of the system that works with all contemporary uh, web browsers. And of course, we'll be keeping our awardees and our applicants informed of that progress as it comes. But it's a little too soon to talk too much about that. Great, thanks, Brian. I think we've addressed most of the questions that have been entered into the chat. Are there any other remaining questions before we sign off? All right. Well, again, um, this 
has been recorded and hopefully we'll be able to put it on the website shortly. We'll also be sending out Brian's uh, training um, desk references as well as a copy of the PowerPoint. So again, apologies earlier for the technical difficulties and the, the small screen. Um, hopefully we can rectify that. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks. Have a good evening.